Um, okay, so we're going to talk about a really boring but very important topic, actually two very boring but important topics today, which are accessibility and internationalization. Um, and uh, because that's exactly what we're talking about, I'm going to ask, how many people here speak Ugaritic? Ugaritic. Really? Well, I don't, so we're, we, we, can, we can do this in Hebrew or in English. What do you prefer? Who wants Hebrew? Who wants Russian? <laughs> okay, who wants English? Okay, well, um, who only knows English? Like, doesn't know Hebrew? Okay, I think there was, uh, I think more people wanted Hebrew than, than English. Is that okay, or are people going to walk out if I start speaking in Hebrew? Okay, Yofi. Tov. אז, okay, אז אנחנו נדבר על שני הנושאים האלה. יש הרבה תוכן, אני ארוץ מהר. אם יש שאלות אתם יכולים לשאול, אני לא מבטיח לענות לכל השאלות. אני אנסה להשאיר זמן בסוף. אז קודם כל, אני עובד כיועץ ומרצה, עבדתי הרבה שנים בסלע ובעוד מקומות אחרים. ברוב המקומות האלה לא נחשפתי יותר מדי לנושא הזה, רק פה ושם היו כמה דברים. אבל לפני שנה בערך עזבתי את העבודה שלי מסיבות אישיות, ואני בעצם עלה לי רעיון בזמן שיצאתי, בזמן שנתתי למדינה לממן את התקופה הזאת. Um, והקמתי עסק וגם uh, ניסיתי להקים איזשהו uh, מוצר, איזשהו סטארט-אפ. הסטארט-אפ הזה, אני קורא לו אינפיניקר, אני לא מנסה לפרסם את זה כי זה עדיין לא קיים אפילו, רק uh, התחלתי לכתוב אותו, יש קוד, אבל אין מה להראות עדיין. הנקודה היא שהסיבה שפיתחתי את הדבר הזה זה בגלל שאני נתקלתי בעצם בפשוט קושי מאוד מאוד גדול להתמודד עם, uh, עם הרשויות. עם כל מה שקשור לרפואה ובריאות. העולם הזה ממש ממש מורכב, כל מי שנתקל, אפילו בדבר הכי קטן כמו נגיד ללכת לחדר מיון ב-11 ב- בלילה ביום שישי, אז, אז כאילו פשוט זה סיוט לא נורמלי מכל הכיוונים. כל הטפסים וסדר פעולות והצדקות, אבל מעבר לזה, כשמנסים לחשוב על איך לבנות תוכנה שיכולה לעזור עם הדברים האלה, אז נתקלים בכל מיני שיקולים שהם קצת... מה? אה, אוקיי. או, אוני אינגליש? אוקיי, אני מצטער. אני עשיתי את זה, אני רוצה להיות מוכנסת. אוקיי, מן הסתם. בכל זאת, כשאתה מנסה להבין את האפליקציה כזאת, a lot of questions come into mind. Basically, I'm not going to talk about the whole thing, don't worry, but the basic idea was to help people who have difficulties, um, you know, manage their health. That means entering medications, uh, schedules, all kinds of things like that. But what happens if the people who need this app have problems that make it difficult to use the app? So over the past year, I've been encountering a million issues of, like, like this, that I never thought about because I don't have any problems with my eyesight, I don't have any problems with my hands, I'm, I'm in pretty good shape. But most people who need these apps aren't. So um, this is sort of a, uh, this is sort of a, uh, I guess, a reflection on the things that I learned and the challenges that I faced uh, during this process. And I hope it can benefit everybody. So let's talk first about accessibility. Um, who knows what this is? Color blindness, okay. So I'm guessing, uh, based on the statistics, that about uh, as many as 10% of the men in this room uh, uh, can only see uh, one of these three. Maybe there are a few others, but that's, that's the statistic. One in 10 men. Um, is colorblind in one way or another. There are lots of different kinds of colorblindness. These are the main ones. This, this is what um, able-bodied people can see, but, uh, but uh, people who have colorblindness, uh, this is a simulation of what they might see. 
And if we, this is actually a test, it's called Ishimara, that, uh, that they use to, to determine what kind of colorblindness you have. Okay, but uh, if you want to see sort of what, what they see, or if other people want to see what you see, in, in whichever case, this is another sort of uh, a way to see it, like how the colors sort of interact. Maybe it looks better or worse, I, I don't know, but uh, uh, this is the normal color, and these are different kinds of color blindness. It's the same ones, just not in the same order. Anyway, how about this? Who can see the, the one on the bottom? <laughs> Nobody, right? But uh, who can see this one? <laughs> if you're wearing glasses, it's not going to make it better in this case, OK? Uh, this is another emulation, an attempt to show what people with partial blindness, with limited eyesight, can see. Um, what about people who uh, uh, sh uh, have tremors? OK, look at this, look at this person's finger. That's not a controlled tremor. The, the finger is shaking. A lot of people have it in all ages. All ages. It can be people our age, kids. Uh, usually it's adults, though. Um, and obviously very old people, maybe with Parkinson's or other conditions. OK, so it's not a pleasant thing to have. Um, it makes it difficult to use a screen. If, uh, if you know someone who is sick and they hold up a smartphone and they try to tap a tiny little button or, or list or something like that, first of all, maybe they can't even see it because their eyesight might be blurry and maybe it's gonna be hard for them to scroll and maybe if they tap, they're gonna miss, okay? Or maybe they tapped accidentally because the finger was too close and it shook, okay? So there are all kinds of issues that I never, I never considered. Um, also, who can identify these things? It's not a trick question. It's a keyboard and a, and a mouse, okay? Um, here's the thing. Mice are terrible, <laughs> okay? They, they help in very specific situations, and we're all very accustomed to using them, but they slow us down. They make things more difficult. <laughs> Uh, for, for some things, and as programmers, most of us prefer the keyboard, but not just programmers, okay? People who are blind, they can't use the mouse at all. People who have limited eyesight, it, it's meaningless to them. They can't move, they can't move the hand. Why can't they move their hand on a, on a, ta on a, a, a touchpad or a mouse? They need hand-eye coordination. A blind person doesn't have hand-eye coordination. It doesn't exist, okay? Um, it's useless for a lot of people in the world. And uh, if you look at kids who are, you know, getting used to, to screens today, uh, when they first use it, they don't, the, the mouse is the, is the one that's hardest for them to get used to. I know because my youngest son is five years old and he just, he went, actually went through this two years ago. I'm, who's, I'm not gonna kid myself, but um, mice are really, really difficult. Um, this is what blind people use. This is a braille, uh, a braille keyboard. Um, yeah, and so kids also have their own difficulties. Sometimes accessibility doesn't mean just uh, um, making the buttons bigger. It may mean simplifying the content, making the content more legible, you know, explaining it differently. Uh, also, their hands are more clumsy and stuff like that. And what about us normal people, you know, um, out there uh, working and we suddenly break our hand and now we have just one hand and maybe it's not our dominant hand and maybe it is, but you know, you only have the one hand to hold the phone and you can't actually reach those corners, right? I mean, this is also a situation and just people who don't have any issues, not that there are any like that, um, it can be really annoying if the system gets in their way, and it does. Okay, uh, also there's this little thing called the law, which uh, now requires that we all implement, at least in Israel, some level of, uh, of uh, accessibility. There are actually uh, uh, several different levels of accessibility. Um, and in the States, uh, there's a requirement that, uh, that every government organization or organizations that work with the government or 
uh, it's a very broad spectrum of, of companies. They also have to use uh, uh, accessible, they also have to be accessible. So, you know, even if you don't agree with any of the other stuff, which doesn't make sense, um, at least you have a legal requirement. So the first thing is, before we get into Angular, where do we start with accessibility? Uh, just a show of hands, how many people here have already done something with accessibility that's in production? Not many, okay. So a few things, first of all, keep in mind that accessibility is for everybody. If you use the app and it's annoying you, it's gonna be 10,000 times more annoying for someone who has a real problem, okay? Um, keep in mind that there are different kinds of ableness, okay? Uh, uh, you can talk about, about people who are crippled or who whatever, but those aren't, that's not a, 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 an accepting or inclusive terminology. Better terminology is trying to understand what they can do and what they can't, okay? So, uh, for example, uh, people who can see and don't have any problems with their eyesight, there, it surprises them, at least it surprised me to hear, uh, that there's a difference between uh, uh, blind and limited vision people, okay? In other words, in the way they use technology, process things, uh, I wasn't aware of that until I, I encountered it. Um, also, just test your system without a mouse. I don't mean your IDE, your code editor, whatever. I mean, open up your app, run it, and just try it without a mouse. See if you can make it everywhere. Just try it. Seriously, it takes two seconds to try, and then uh, another hour to cry, and then you get to work, okay? So, uh, as, yeah, especially the menus and the dialogues. Try to navigate your app with a screen reader. There are lots of screen readers. I'm not gonna talk about them. There's screen readers for Windows, for Mac, for Linux, uh, for their inside the browsers, for, for your, your phones. They have built-in screen readers, actually. Okay, so they're all over the place and they're free. Okay, just try one. Um, talk to people <laughs> that have issues. Ask them, ask them, how your, how your app is for, ask them how they're doing with your app. Can they use it successfully? It's so simple, just, just talk to them, <laughs> okay? Um, and uh, watch people. I, you can use Hotjar or some fancy UI testing, or you can just look over their shoulder and ask, why did you do that, or didn't you see that, and try to listen to their answers. Don't tell them how to do it right. Ask them why they thought that was the way to do it. Um, and focus on UX. Uh, UX engineering um, already incorporates a lot of these things into its, its principles are already based on them. Okay, so these are things that have helped me. Uh, so first, let's start with the easy fixes. One, um, use tab stops. Okay, it's really simple. In your code, doesn't matter if it's regular HTML or if it's a, a rich application, if you're using Angular or anything else, just use the tab index attribute, specify uh, that it should be a tab stop or it shouldn't or the sequence if, they, if, it's, if it's important to you. It's one of the easiest ways to add accessibility. Um, use higher contrast, okay? Um, in fact, it occurs to me now that uh, I might not have high enough contrast on my slides. But uh, you can definitely see that there's a bit of a higher contrast there because I put it on a white, uh, uh, black on white instead of these dark on light colors. Okay? Does anybody notice that? Do you, do you disagree? It looks the same? What? We had something with the low contrast earlier in one of the slides in the last session. We couldn't see anything. Yeah, the, these, uh, the projectors and the screens also have low contrast. It's, uh, it's an issue. But, if you think about it, maybe the way that we're seeing it now with this low contrast is sort of like the way that a lot of older people or people with uh, limited vision often see the regular screen, okay, when it's flashing by at 60 frames a second, okay, and, and very brightly. Okay, so um, use bigger fonts, uh, depending on your users, of course, and their needs. Um, closed captioning, if you have videos, Use closed captioning. The video element 
and the uh, audio element, they support subtitles and closed captioning and lots of different, they're really, really advanced uh, tools in there that you can add all kinds of markers to your videos to help screen readers, to help uh, 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 people who can't see, who can't hear, um, use it. It's, it's easy to do, it might take some time, but it's very easy. Uh, use the alt attribute, okay? The alt attribute is super important. There's a reason it's become mandatory on images in HTML5. It used to be an optional attribute, now it's mandatory. Um, by the way, editors will, uh, most editors today, when they complete automatically, they add it for you, just don't delete it and type something in the attribute. It's really easy. Um, use ARIA. How many people have heard of ARIA? Okay, ARIA is one of the new modules in HTML5. It's a, it actually started before HTML5, but it's been incorporated into the standard, sort of like SVG and lots of other standards. Um, so ARIA is basically this uh, standard that tells, that, that um, uh, provides all kinds of attributes and elements that you can add to your HTML. And what these do is they tell screen readers and they tell search engines and they tell all kinds of assisted devices uh, how to parse your page, what the meaning of different elements on your page is. For example, if there's a list item and you use li, then the screen reader is gonna know and you probably don't need uh, an, ARIA at, an ARIA attribute Okay, maybe you do, but you, you might not. On the other hand, if you use a div that's clickable, somebody who doesn't see and uses a screen reader to tell them what's on the screen, it will not be able to know that that div has an important job. They won't know that it works like a button, for example. So either use a button element or a, uh, uh, I don't know, an input uh, type equals button element, or an A that's formatted differently, or use ARIA attributes on your divs and spans and whatever. ARIA attributes can provide a lot of that functionality, okay? So um, I'm not going to go a lot into this, but I am going to show an example uh, a little bit later. Use semantic markup. If you use button and li and a and p, that really, really helps. Um, uh, it really helps uh, all of these uh, tools that we talked about. It helps search engines, so it'll improve your SEO, but that's an added benefit. In, in my opinion, the real benefit is that it makes your site accessible to anybody who might use it. And uh, yeah, this is, uh, this is something I used to do, and I'm ashamed of it now. Uh, you know how when you change focus from, you know, you do tab in the web page, and uh, there's a focus rectangle that shows you where it is? So it looks ugly sometimes. Maybe the cutters don't look right on your app or something like that. So um, uh, don't get rid of it. It's really important. Don't change the styles. There are people who rely on it. Uh, if you do want to, you can maybe change the color or something to make it uh, clear that it's there, but don't hide it, don't remove it. Okay, so uh, just in Angular, when you use tab stops, um, it's uh, just like regular tab stops, you use tab index equals zero to say, just put it wherever it is in the document order, but support a tab. Doesn't matter where it is, it'll, it'll work properly. Uh, if you say minus one, then it won't tab, uh, it, it will not tab to it. It won't be in the tab order. That's also important because sometimes you use elements that shouldn't be, that shouldn't be there and uh, um, they get, they can be annoying. Um, ARIA attributes. So uh, when you use Angular and you want to use ARIA, you often have to use ARIA, especially when you create complex components, uh, what you do is you put the um, ARIA role, uh, can't see it like that. So there's, an, uh, you, you have to use the ATTR uh, uh, prefix because the ARIA attributes are not DOM properties. Okay, so you have to use it and you can use it with uh, any of the ARIA, um, any of the ARIA um, uh, attributes. So, uh, there are a few examples here 
uh, things that are recognized by screen readers. Uh, these are things that, for example, a user would tell the screen reader, okay, I want you to raise it one, okay, or something like that, it, or increment the value by one. And because there's a value max, it will, it will know when not, you, it's locked, you can't get out. <laughs> Uh, the, value, the, the value max will, will actually cause the screen reader to tell you, no, you've reached the max value. Um, testing. You have to do testing. There are lots of different ways to do testing. Let's start with manual tests. Manual tests are here to stay, and you really need them. You have to talk to people who have difficulties, and you have to talk to people who understand it and can emulate the difficulties so that they can run through your apps and they can try it out as though they have different kinds of impairments, different kinds of problems. Okay, it's really important. But you can also automate some of them. Okay, so uh, as a programmer, um, very often the ARIA attributes are dynamic. The values that they get are dynamic. Add them to your unit tests. You want to make sure that if somebody performs some action and the button is disabled, that the ARIA attributes reflect that state. Otherwise, the screen reader will think that the button is actually available, okay, for example. Uh, or if somebody's filling out a form, they can't see that the button is enabled or disabled, and they might just try to submit it. If you don't use an ARIA attribute, then the, uh, uh, the screen reader will believe that it's possible to submit, even though it isn't, and there, it will not be able to tell them why the operation is successful or not successful. Okay, so it's really, really important. Um, a lot of people with uh, vision impairment um, do not use Chrome because Chrome is a bit difficult to uh, automate. Uh, so all of the accessibility APIs and all that are less uh, developed in Chrome. It's something that's being improved and worked on. Uh, the latest Canary, for example, has some improvements in that area, but it's still not uh, at the same level as Edge, and Firefox, I think, has always been uh, very accessible, but I don't remember for sure. Um, also, there are uh, new tools today like Lighthouse. How many have heard of Lighthouse? So Lighthouse is a diagnostic tool that's in the latest Canaries. I think it's in uh, Canary 59 or, 50 or 60, I don't remember exactly, that provides a lot of very important diagnostic information on, uh, on uh, things like, are you ready for PWAs and stuff like that, but also on accessibility. Um, I have an example here. Um, let's open up our favorite new site. Really, only five minutes? Okay. Uh, I'll try, I'm going to have to speak faster. Is that going to be okay? All right. So uh, this is, I'm going to take the time anyway. I really want to show what happens with our uh, favorite site. I hope there's nobody here from Ynet because this is a really excellent example for a terribly written site. Okay. <laughs> um, it's, uh, I, I use it for almost everything. Okay. That's not what I expected. Okay, well, what's interesting to us is uh, this accessibility thing. Now, it says 91 here because something went wrong, uh, but really, um, uh, it's a beta, okay, seriously. Um, but what it shows us is a list of things that fail different kinds of accessibility tests. Uh, so, for example, we're not using, okay, it's, a, it's just giving us the wrong info, but Go ahead and try it, dig down into it. You'll see like lists of links that don't have alt or uh, images that don't have alt and stuff like that. Um, there are lots of other tools, browser extensions, uh, Axe. This is a slide from um, um, uh, Marcy uh, Sutton. She, she has a really excellent uh, uh, presentation on testing for accessibility. Um, I, I stole it from her. And, um, okay, there are also more complex solutions. You can read it later. I'm not going to get into it. Just sometimes the technology isn't enough, and you have to design for accessibility. So uh, we only have, like, 10 minutes, right? No? <laughs> okay. I'm trying my luck, really. Uh, okay, so we don't have enough time to talk about internationalization. What I will say is this. It's actually really simple. 
you know what? No, I'm going to go through these, and then uh, don't worry, it'll it'll work. Um, what's this? It's a date. What's the date? What? This is my brother's birthday. He was born on March 4th. Okay, but you can't know. What time is it? <laughs> well, this was supposed to be the time my lecture start, was supposed to start, but I was late, so um, it's uh, supposed to be 3.55 p.m., but of course, we're not in the right time zone or culture, okay? How about this? A little bit more tricky, a little bit trickier. So uh, this is, if you're in Germany or Canada, this is 295. Just exactly 295, okay? Um, if you're here, of course, and you count like a real person, then it's 295,000, right? Um, how, about, uh, how about this? What's this? No, it, it is what it says, okay? But the, the trick is that uh, it's a different font size. Uh, it, when I tried to do it at the same font size, it, it went underneath the, the slide. I had, to, I had to adjust not just the text, but also but also the, uh, you know, the whole environment. Um, okay, so this is the I-18 template translation process that Angular has. We don't have to go over it because we don't have time, but also because it's really simple. This is the process. You have to mark your elements and texts and attributes and whatever with the I-18 and attribute. You have to uh, run an extraction tool uh, if you use the Angular CLI, it's much easier, so use the Angular CLI tool. Uh, it's called ng uh, uh, ix18n, or xi18n, sorry. Um, and it has really good help, and it shows what it does. It's pretty simple. And then you send it to a translator, because uh, none of us are good at that. Um, or you don't send it to a translator, and, and then your end users will complain, um, and it'll cost you a lot of money. Um, and then you get, back the you get the translation files back, you merge them in, you save them in source control, all the files are stored in, in Git or whatever, um, and uh, then you build. Uh, now, if you use JIT compilation, you don't actually have to build it. It will be built automatically by Webpack, and it will, you'll be able to switch languages on the fly. If you use AOT, which creates much, much faster uh, bootstrapping process, it will actually, you will actually have to run the, the build tool several times, one for each language, and it will produce a separate app, okay? So um, uh, you'll actually have to deliver a different app based on the, the language that the browser reports to you. I know it's annoying, they're working on it, uh, it'll improve. Uh, let's skip all of this, there's lots of stuff here on how to use the i18 attributes. There's support for pluralization, which is extremely different in every language, so the syntax is a little unique. In other words, you put a number, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, a number on a property, and then you designate the pluralization rules, and you just give it to a translator, and that translator can actually define different pluralization rules for different languages, and it will work properly. It will work right. Okay, there's also select in case, uh, it's very similar to pluralization, except that it's for different types of things. Like uh, here there's an example of uh, uh, gender or, or sex or I don't know, anything that's, that's specific to your region. Okay, like uh, I don't know, one app could have, uh, one location could have it say Palestine and another could have it say Israel, just as an extreme example. Um, you can also nest them, okay. Um, Let's skip forward because we don't have time. I'm really, really sorry. I didn't, apparently, I didn't plan this for half an hour. Um, yeah, so I'll end with this. Final recommendations for uh, localization, for internationalization. First of all, always use custom IDs, okay? I didn't, uh, uh, I didn't show it, but it's in the slides. When you use the I18N attribute, always add an equal sign, which is optional, but add it and always use two at, uh, two, um, uh, at signs, Stoldenim, uh, with an identifier after that. Otherwise, you will have, um, you, you'll be very, very annoyed, okay? <laughs> uh, 
Um, yeah, it's on video, right? We don't want to, uh, okay. Um, always commit them. Uh, yeah, the most important is research the culture, okay? Uh, there are differences for color, like red can be insulting in some cultures and really, really sexy in others. I mean, it's, you, you really have to uh, look into it and compare it, especially if you're targeting specific audiences or cultures or subcultures, okay? And uh, that's it. Uh, this was a really, really fast run through and there's a whole lot more on this, uh, but it's all I could boil down into it. And I guess we don't have time for questions, but I'll be here for a bit. And uh, thank you, I'm, I'm sorry, thank you. <laughs>